All right, so today is Tuesday, the 27th of October. This is going to be a very different period because, and I've done this before, but um, what I haven't done before is forgotten what my password is for my Mac. And I can't remember it. So I, I set up an appointment with Mac tonight for their support center to help me walk through the process of either retrieving it or getting a new one. All right. So what that means is I'm not going to be able to follow along with you right now. I've got my choice. I could either follow along with you right now and not tape this because that machine is the only one that's got, Camt it's got Camtasia for the Mac on it. All right. So hopefully this will be a one-day thing. All right. Also, between now and I'm not sure when. Okay, today is the 27th. So if we do the math, the 29th. So next week is like the 4th or something like that, then the 11th, then the 18th. So we've got four more weeks, full weeks, until the break. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. What I'm going to do on the Thursdays is I'm going to go over the homework. So if you didn't do the homework, please come. When I say that I'm going to go over the homework, that's what I'm going to do. But that said, I'm not going to sit there and key stuff in and then save it so you can just grab it and turn it in because that's stupid on my part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the material in the assignments. If you want to follow along, fine. If I'm going too fast, kind of tough because we've got stuff we've got to get through. All right, and I will tape it, so you'll have to go back and watch the tapes. If you have not turned in the work, it'll give you a chance to get that work done and turned in. Now, the difference is if you have turned in the work, you're, you're eligible for, you know, if the assignment's worth 50 points, you're eligible for 50 points. If you have not turned in the work and you basically do it based off of this, the best you're going to be able to get is a C. But you'll pass. All right. Does all that make sense? All right, so that's what we're going to do on Thursdays, possibly until Thanksgiving or until we've got all the assignments done. There's only been, there's been three assignments, I believe. There was the first one, which was the loan amortization program. All right, so there was that one. And then the second one was all the other ones that I put on the first assignment. Okay, and then the third one was to go back to the loan amortization program and include structures and include pointers in it. All right, so I'll be going over those. That's about five or six programs. One of them is repeated, but, but about five or six programs for the next few weeks. All right, okay. So the idea is what I'd like to start on today is we're switching gears because this is an introduction to the material that you will learn in the class that is the follow on from this one. 152, 156, and it's called 152, 153, thank you. 152, 153, mobile web dev uh, iOS. All right, it might even say iPhone. I don't know. Every time I try to make changes, they always tell me, yeah, you can make changes, and then they don't let me make changes when stuff is mismarked or whatever. All right, but what I want to do here. Before we even look at anything, go over anything, is I want, I want to just mention some of the stuff that's in here because this is syntax. So don't worry about writing a program or doing anything. Just if you could, for about 10 or 15 minutes, look up on the screen here. All right? All right. It's interesting because over the weekend, I went to, uh, I went to St. Louis to visit my daughter. When my daughter and my wife shop, I like to do anything but shop. All right, so we were at this outlet mall, and they have a movie theater there. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, I went and I saw the new Steve Jobs movie, all right, which was a very interesting and a very intense movie, okay? You may or may not know this, but when Jobs got fired originally from Apple, he started his own company. He called it Next, okay? And... What he did was he created a computer for education, and at the time, computers for education were running around two to four thousand dollars. Okay, his was ten thousand dollars. He, you know, in many ways, at least according to what I've read and what they've kind of 
portrayed in the movie, he created this next thing knowing it would fail. He actually did it knowing it would fail. And most people don't do that. All right. But what he did was while this was happening, max sales, max share of the market after they got rid of him went down from about 35% to 3%. Now, you may or may not agree with this, but that's a pretty big drop. All right. If a candidate going, running for president goes up from 3% to 35%, they're probably going to be the front runner. So this was the reverse. But what he did, and, and I, I, I've got to watch my, my way I say this here because I'm not saying this to, to be critical of him, but in some ways, when, when he showed what his next thing would look like, he lied. And what I mean is he gave a demo and there was no real operating system. He fudged the operating system for the demo. So why would he do something like that? Basically, the reason he did it is he hired this unbelievably intelligent guy. Not him, but he, he hired this really un unbelievably intelligent guy that was going to create the operating system, and he did it knowing Mac would want to buy it because their stuff was floundering, and part of it was because of their operating system. All right? So he had this all in his head already. They could buy it, but they'd have to bring him back, and they'd have to give him half a billion dollars which they did, all right? And that's how the whole thing happened. So the reason I'm telling you this is we're talking now around approximately 25 years ago, okay? When he got into, net, in, into Next and they started on their operating system, okay, that was called basically Next Step was the operating system. The reason I'm telling you all this is that particular operating system was written in a brand new language that was called Objective-C. All right, And when he sold everything back to Mac, one of the things that they agreed to use for their operating system was Objective-C. All right, You'll see a little bit of that in this first document, the one that says appendix on it. That's the good news. The bad news is everything in that language, everything, basically everything in that language is a pointer. So you write some god-awful looking code when you do this. I taught this stuff last year and the year before. And people, by and large, were just like, this, I don't understand a bit of this. All right? And because it's really super hard to read and super hard to use. So what Mac did back in around, I don't know, I, I think it was June of 2014 at their WWDC, the Worldwide Developer Con Conference, which is their Mac conference, they announced that for the previous four years, they'd been working on a brand new language that was going to replace Objective-C. By and large, most people who heard this, by and large, were amazed. Because the people working on it, from what I understand, were not only sworn to secrecy, but they had to sign secrecy agreements. So they introduced this brand new language, which is what we're going to start talking about right now, Swift. All right, And it didn't have much fanfare because no one knew it was coming. The idea is eventually eventually, what Swift is supposed to do is it's supposed to replace Objective-C for everything, okay? And I'm going to tell something that, that probably, probably, even Mr. Wanda doesn't know, okay? That is what Mac announced last week is Swift is going open source, and they're already creating tools that you're going to be able to create Android apps using Swift. So I know that's not like Apple, but Jobs is dead, you know? And they're not dumb. He's, he was sure not a dummy, but the people there are not dumb. They see this market, and they see people who want to go and create apps, and, they, and they, they have to teach themselves Java or something else, and it's too hard. Hopefully what you learn as we go through this is this language, in some ways, is hard, but in some ways, it's pretty intuitive. Okay? Now, a couple things. Notice this. And I'm just taking it from the top here. You see the word var, and you see the word let. If you put var in front of something, it's a variable. Now, that's not hard to you know, fathom. If you put let in front of something, it's a constant. Now, the old idea, the old idea of making constants uppercase, they're, they're, they're basically saying, people from Apple, don't do it. Just make your, your vars and your lets look the same. 
You can make them uppercase if you want to. And if that makes it easier for you to remember that it's a constant, you can do that. All right, but Mac themselves, or Apple, recommends that you do it like this. Also, you see something that's missing there? There's no data type. You can put the data type in, and we'll look at that in just a second. But what happens is if you set this up, the system infers that number of rows is an int. And it infers that max number of rows is an int. That's called type inference. And again, the recommendation from Apple is that you use type inference and you don't put the type down. What about the semicolon? Not there yet. So again, if you saw these same things that you see on screen right here, <clears throat> if you saw them in C, for example, you'd have to say int number of rows equal 30, and then either const or pound to five. Okay, all that makes sense? All right, Zane just mentioned, forevermore now in this language, from what I understand, semicolons are optional. The only time that you need to put a semicolon in is if for some reason I wanted to put these two things on the same line. Then I'd have to say var number of rows equal 30 semicolon, let the max number of rows equal 100. But I wouldn't need one on the end. All right? So you never, as far as I know, you never need a semicolon in this language. Some of the other stuff that you're going to see in just a second. When you have a switch statement, you don't need the word break anymore. It doesn't fall through like it did in the past. You can make it fall through, but you have to explicitly tell it you want it to fall through. And I believe the way that you do that, I believe that the command is fall through. So again, they try to be very intuitive with stuff that they've done. Not only that, if you remember almost from day one, I'd always say something like this. If you say if x greater than 3, y equals 7, something like that. That's the way we would do it in C, right? So we'd say if, and then in parentheses, x greater than 3, then y equals 7. Well, I always mention that it's a good thing to put curly braces around there, even if it's just a single line. Now, in, in Swift, you don't need this. You have to always put the curly braces in, even if it's just one line. And you need the parens. Okay? You say, well, we always had those. Yeah, but you need them. You know, on some languages, you don't need them, but in this language, you do. All right? So what I'm just trying to do is go over this and give you some of the some of the syntax. That's all. Just some of it. All right. All right. They also mentioned, boy, if you really want to know this, supposedly once you're logged in, you can hold down on the control key and the command key at the same time and hit the space bar, and it brings up an emoji picker. Because God knows that's important. All right. Actually, depending on who you are and how you send out texts. That might be one of the most important things that there is to you. All right. Now, if you look at this, this is the way that you used to do this in Objective C. You'd say NS string, and it was case sensitive, star because it was a pointer, all right, and then you'd have to preface everything with the at sign. Now, all you have to say is var my message equals and that stuff. Do you see the difference between them? So the idea is it's much easier to write the declarative variables, and your, your code is much simpler to write. All right. So they show some examples here. It says it's your responsibility to, in, to specify the type in Objective-C. In Swift, you don't have to. I already mentioned there's type inference. So you can do all this stuff. Everything that they have there is just fine. It's either here or else it's in the first chapter. We're going to look at an example where they show the same four or five lines of code, first in Objective-C, then they show it in Swift. And in many ways, it is night and day as far as which one's easy to use. All right. So if you still do want to put the data type in there, var variable name colon data type. So you could say for the one we looked at before, where we had that var num rows equal 10, 
we could say var num rows colon int equal 10. All right. The recommendation by Apple is that unless you really have a strong need, and, and, and looking at their documentation, they can't figure out a time you never have that strong need, you should never do that. See, I would think that you'd want to do it like this because it would help the compiler basically by giving it a key and say, you know, no, it, that's, not what, that's not how it works. All right. If the compiler checks have already been built in with the type inference, it already knows. The only thing that we can hold in here from here on, whether I don't put that in there or I do put, it, put that in there, is a string. And strings have to be in double quotes. Not single quotes or double quotes, just double quotes. All right. Real easy to do basic string manipulation. All right. So in other words, if I wanted to say this, this, what you see right there, the stuff in gray. Let, well, it doesn't come out very gray. But if I, went, if I said let first message equal Swift is awesome with a space. Let second message equals what do you think? Message equals first message plus second message. Print message. What that does is it prints in a console area at the bottom of the screen, but it adds those two strings together. So it says Swift, Swift is awesome, what do you think? Okay, and not, not who cares? The point is, the plus sign you can use as a string concatenation character, or as addition. If you wanted to do this same thing in Objective-C, that's what you'd have to do. All right, sorry, because it's got all the squigglies. I didn't run a spell check on it. I hate doing that because if you just say ignore all, it ignores it for that, set, that session. And if you say add to the dictionary, now I've got 10,000 things in the dictionary I really don't want in there. All right, but the point is, Look at this versus this. We have it here, what? One, two, three different pointers. All right. We have two different at signs, three different at signs. Okay. And here, when we want to put these two together, you can't just say plus from the NS string class. You have to call the string with format method. But now what they tried to do is really clean up the code. Their hope, I think, the hope of Apple is people are going to want to develop for every mobile app using this. So they're trying to make the simplest language possible. All right. So as they mentioned, in Objective-C, you can't use the equal equal operator. Okay. In there, you have to use is equal to string or something else. Here, you can just do this. I've got two strings. I can just say up here, if the first string is equal to the second string, that's pretty cool. You can't do that in most programming languages. All right, you can in here. All right. Now, there's a couple things, and again, I'm giving you some Objective-C. You might think, well, do I do, the question that actually comes up, do I need to learn Objective-C? I will tell you that if, if the, your plan is to leave here, and eventually get a job as a developer, an iPhone developer, or I, whatever, um, yeah, you have to learn Objective-C. Because what's happening is the stuff that's out there right now, the legacy code, is written in Objective-C. You can combine Objective-C and Swift in the same application. You can put it together. All right? But the, what Apple is recommending is all new development be done using Swift. That's their recommendation. I'm not saying everybody's going to do it, because there's a lot of people out there who are very talented Objective-C developers. All right, but the idea is they're trying to make it easier so that you will. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, again, I'm just giving you some history, but just so you know this. Back in the days of Objective-C, when you created an array, this is not what we have in Swift, but with Objective-C. It was like creating an array in JavaScript or in PHP. You could, I could sit there and put a name in there, then I could put a salary in there. Then I could put a higher date in there. In other words, I could, in other words, I could mix data types. You can't do that. So if you in, in Swift, so if you set up an array in Swift, everything in the array must be of the same data type. And the reason for that is you can use that type inference with arrays also. So the system knows because what you have in here are one, two, three, four five different strings, it must be a string array. All right. 
Also, if you say var, when you create the array, if you say var, that means you can just add whatever you want to the array. You can remove whatever you want from the array. If you say let, since it's a constant, once you set up the array, you can't change it. Does that make sense? Now, back in the days of Objective-C, if you wanted to set up an array and you wanted to be able to change it, you had to say it was an NS mutable array. You had to set it up like that. Mutable meaning changeable. All right, and otherwise, I believe as they say there, you, you set it up as just an NS array, and then you couldn't change it. I don't think there was an unmutable. I think it was NS array and NS mutable array. Swift has a bunch of different methods that you can use with arrays. Here's an example. So we created this recipes array right here. And then we say number of items equals recipes dot count. And it counts how many elements you have. So it comes back one, two, three, four, five. It gives you that answer. They're still zero based, all right, but it counts how many are in there. So if I want to add a new one, there's how I can do it the name of the array plus equals. And notice that all the stuff we're doing with arrays, it's all brackets. This is all stuff you're going to have to look at, understand, and start to get familiar with. What I hope to do this semester, I don't know if it's going to be one, two, or three, but create a couple simple apps as a class. Every app that we create as a class, you will be responsible for getting to work and turn in. We'll do it as a class, so it's not like this should be a problem. All right, but like I said, and you know, you came in a little late, but just so you hear, um, for, for whatever reason, I can't remember my password on my Mac because I haven't used it in a year. So this will, this hopefully will be the only time that I'm actually lecturing on a Mac from this machine. Next, because I have Camtasia for the Mac on that machine. So hopefully, come next week when we go over the next example of this, all right, the next iteration of this, I'll be lecturing from there. It'll look the same on here. And actually, the only thing I will tell you, um, this is a good mic, so this has changed. But last year, the mic, I, I'm using the mic that's actually built into the Mac there. It's unbelievably powerful. So for lack of better words, watch what you say. Okay, because I, I had somebody last semester who did have a little expletive, and you, you kind of could hear it on the... Uh, on the tape. It wasn't terrible expletive, but it was, you know, they just were mad because something wasn't working and they were sitting near the front. All right. Not only can I add a single item, I can say plus equals and add as many items as I want to in there. All right. If I want to access the array elements, notice, again, it's zero based and we're always using brackets, not parens, always brackets. All right. So here we're changing the second element, which would be recipe sub one. So originally that was mushroom, whatever it is, risotto, and now it's cupcake, just so you get the idea. All right. This is kind of cool. What this says is I want to go in and I want to be able to change. Remember, it's zero based, so that's item one. Uh, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. This says take whatever were the second, third, and fourth. So that says take this, second, the third, and the fourth, right there. That says take those and replace them with these three. Does that make sense? All right. There's a boatload of documentation out there for Swift. Last year what I did was I printed everybody a copy of the Swift manual. All right, and I gave it out. Some people loved it and some people hated it. What, why would they hate it? It's 500 pages. So Zane has it if you want to buy a bootleg copy. All right. Now, there's a few other things that you can work with in here. And they only talk about one of them for whatever reason right now. But So let's just leave it at this. We talk about dictionaries. All right. So... Let's pretend for a second that you didn't know what the word dictionary meant, all right? But somebody gave you a dictionary. So you'd probably look under the Ds, 
find the word dictionary, and then look at the definition, correct? A dictionary works the same way. It's key values. So here's the key, A-A-P-L, here's the value, Apple Inc. Here's the key, Goog, here's the value, Google Inc. Get the idea? So you, it's, it's, you're, it's like you're setting up an array. It's like an associative array that we've had in other languages like PHP. Because what we're doing here is we're setting up an array. They're showing you here how you do it in Objective-C. I'm just going to skip that. But here, they're saying we're setting up an, a new dictionary that's called companies. All right? Here's the key. Here's the value. Here's the key. Here's the value. Here's the key, value, key, and value. Do those make sense? The keys must be unique. Because what those keys are replacing are the equivalent of like array indices. So if I went back in here and tried to do this, and instead of FB here, I typed in AAPL again when I already had it up here, I'd get an error message. What you're gonna find when we start working with this is this is not nearly as swift as, as, as I was going to say swift, but that would be a bad pun, but it's not nearly as slick as it is with um, Visual Studio. All right, and why is that? Because you're used to using Visual Studio. If you'd learned on a Mac first and then you were going to Visual Studio now, you'd probably say this is near, not nearly as easy as what I'm doing on Mac. All right, so it's just a matter of getting used to things. Now, Mac is, since it's being open sourced, probably within a year or less, I don't know. But the idea is, the next time I teach this class, there's a good chance that you don't need Macs. You'll be able to do it on an Intel machine. All right. I, I still don't think it's a bad thing to use Macs and get used to using Macs. All right. But again, that's, that's my opinion. You may or may not agree with that. But again, dictionaries are key value pairs. All right. If you want to say the type that goes in there, instead of using that colon, you've got to do it, you know, and, and saying string or whatever, it's the word dictionary, then followed by this is the type of the key, this is the type of the value. All right? Just another reason. If I have my choice between doing it like this and doing it like this, I'm going to choose that one every time because it's less typing. All right? All right. Then they talk about how you can iterate through this using a special kind of for loop. I don't even want to get into that right now. All right? So that's the first one. That's the one that said appendix on it. So I'm, I'm going to go on. I'm assuming that if you have questions as we start to go through this stuff, maybe this is a dumb assumption, but I'm assuming you're going to ask. Yes? Can you also refer to the elements in the dictionary with the numbers? Can you? Uh, yeah, yes, you can, because in order to do that, you just would use numbers. Yes, yes. All right. I want you to understand something, too. If you look up on the, top, on the screen right here, what I always do when I take something from online, I, I always want to give it attribution. All right? So I, I don't claim that this is my stuff. So why am I even telling you that? Because I want you to see this. And I've got a bunch of stuff open, right? Well, I guess not that much anymore. But What I'm showing you right now is I went out. This is a book that's literally, it's an e-book. So it's online, and it's from a company that's called AppCoda. A-P-P-C-O-D-A dot com. And their book is called Learn Swift. You'll notice if you look through here, there's almost 30 chapters. In fact, 28, and then there's the appendix. So what I've given you is the appendix, and I've already given you out chapters 1 and 2. If we get any further than that, I also have 3, 4, and 5 here, ready to pass out to you. All right? But what I'm telling you is this book is probably as good as anything I found out there. That's the good news. The bad news is I don't think there's a hard copy of it. So if you look here, for instance, I'm just going to go to the Swift Playgrounds thing, and I'm going to peruse my way through it. And I get down to the bottom. 
It says, love this chapter, want to get a full copy of the book? And you go there, this is the different ways that you can buy it. All right? So, notice every one of them says ebook. I would, no, I'm not going to ask you to pay $169. No, not at all. I'm just showing you the different packages. That's not bad. All right, so you could buy your own for $69. That's probably in, in line pretty much with, with some of the books you have. Some are more expensive, some are less expensive. All right, then you can get only the book and the source code, which is probably what we need. That's $39. That's not bad. All right, then somewhere over here, they also talk about, let's see, I don't know where it is. Here, purchase the book in bulk. Buy a team license for $499. And if we did that, there would be absolutely no difference between you buying it yourself for $39 and buying it in bulk, except that if we had to pay $499, I'd ask, I'd, I'd just divide it by 20. And I, if there's 14 of you in here, all right, that would pay for 280 of it. I'd have to come up with the other 220 myself or with have the school try to come up with it. See what I'm saying? So that would be the cheapest way of doing it if we go with that. What I can show you after the break, because I've got it in my car, all right, is I, I found a book. There's not many books out here that have been upgraded to Swift version 2, all right, with the newest version of Xcode. There's almost nothing out there. One of the ones that is out there is a book I ordered and got over the week, well, about a week ago. And that's this one. Oh, man. Wow. Look at this. iOS 9 Essentials. Okay. October 17th. I guess that's even a newer one. That one wasn't even out there when I ordered this one. So I've got this one. I'm already behind. All right. And regardless of which one of these you look at, I'm sure that it's going to be very similar to the other one. And you go through it, boom, boom, boom. And we keep looking through it and looking through it and looking through it. This is not the whole book, of course. But let's see. Now he's up from 99 chapters to 101 chapters. And there would be no way we could go through much more than 20 or so chapters in here, even though they're short chapters. Look, there's 101 chapters, and the book is 750 pages. Do the math. That's about seven and a half pages per chapter. All right. The guy's writing style isn't bad. I was reading his book on the way back from, I wasn't driving, but I was reading his, his book on the way back from St. Louis. All right. It's the price isn't bad. The problem is, I mean, it, I said this the other day. If I was leaving here and I was taking a job and I was going to be a full-time iOS developer, I'd buy this book because it has basically everything in it you could ever think of. It starts with you having virtually no knowledge whatsoever. So when you look here, start here, how to join their developer program, installing Xcode, a guided tour of Xcode, introduction of playgrounds, start talking about data types, operators, flow control, etc. All right. But even that, there's enough stuff in there because it's a newer type of syntax. So I'll, I'll bring, bring the version 8 that I've got down after the break and let you look at it. All right. Then I found another book, but it's just in the other direction. It's almost like if you, if you imagine that an author wrote a book and said, okay, I'm going to teach you iOS development, but I'm going to teach it to you by having you color, literally having you color, bullet crayons and color. So that one's way too simple. So I'm looking for one that's kind of in between there. And if I go out here, so if I go out to Amazon like this, and I type in Swift 2.0, all right, it's got this one, and I've looked at that book. I don't like it. This is not really 2.0. This one has, does not come out until after Christmas or around Christmas. These are all different kinds. i have already going to give you Chapter 1 of this book a little bit later, but that's about all there is. All the stuff that's in there, they're Swift books, but they're not Swift 2. And I wanted you to get the latest and greatest stuff, so to speak, that's out there. All right? 
So my suggestion, and you've got those in front of you. Now, all the stuff that I've given you copies of, for instance, if, if you look at chapter one that you have in front of you right now, yours looks like this. Getting started with Xcode development. Yours looks, this is it. There are a couple of graphics or so on there, but that's what you've got. On the other hand, if I go out to appcoda.com and I go to getting started, you'll notice I, I did not give you the pictures. See that? I gave you those. That's about the only graphic that you have in there is what's in here. But what this book is filled with are screenshots. And I, did, I removed all the screenshots. Why? Two reasons. First of all, I tried to make these short and sweet. It took me a half an hour to copy all this junk this morning. All right? And, and so I didn't want to waste a lot of paper. Second, they're distorted. In other words, when you print them out, instead of being this size, they're more this size. So they don't show very well on the page. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's why I did it. So what I'd like you to do between now and a week from now, just start thinking about it. But by... I think it's November 15th. It's either the 7th or the 15th. I have to have book orders in. All right? And I have absolutely no problem if you say, you know what? I'll pay the extra 14 bucks. I don't want to buy a book with my class. I want to buy my own book. Then we all do it that way. I have no problem at all doing that. All right, but I'm going to get this book. I'm going to pay, probably pay the $39 myself. The, the, the advantage of doing it that way, too, is you do that. If you've got a credit card or whatever, you get instant access. And I believe you get instant, instant access to all the source code, and you get instant access to any updates they have for the book. All right? All right, so let's look at Chapter 1, and then we'll take a break. Again, there's only three pages here. Okay? Chapter 1, getting started with Xcode development. So you want to create your own app. That's great. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. What do you need? Number one, get a Mac. Yes, you need a Mac. All right, that's why we have Macs. In the future, will you need a Mac? Again, that's up to interpretation. We'll see as time goes on. I don't know. If you want, you, you, know, you can go out online, and about the only thing that you can use, other than like we have here, like a MacBook or a MacBook Pro, is this will work under a Mac Mini. I did have somebody who had a Mac Mini. They loaded it on there. They thought it was much slower running on the Mac Mini but I don't remember what they had for memory or whatever, so that could have been what it was. All right? But you need some kind of Mac at least right now. All right? And I'm telling you this. I'm not asking you to say thank you. I'm not asking for a pat on the back. I'm not asking for anything. It took three years for me to convince them to buy these machines. And there's a good chance, you know, this whatever we have here, probably for the next five or more years, they're not going to buy new ones. You know, even if there's the money for it. They throw money into other programs, and they don't give a damn what, what their numbers are. They'll just throw money at them. But because I'm considered to be more a rebel, yeah, you look at me, because you know, it, it just you look at me and you think rebel. But uh, because I've asked for stuff in the past, and when I haven't gotten it, I've thrown a little bit of a hissy fit, they're more apt to give me nothing. All right? So we're going to work with what we have. All right. Number two. The suggestion is you go out to this site, and I'm going to get probably tell you another thing that you don't know right now, okay? That you go out there and you register into the Apple developer's website. You, you register as a developer. It's free. The only email that I've ever gotten was the one confirming that, indeed, I wanted to do this. You know, click this link. And as soon as I did, I never got another one from them. What this does is let's say that Zane likes this and he, he goes out and he buys himself his own, you know, he, he buys himself his own MacBook. All right. Now what it does is he can now go out to the Apple Store and what he'll see is much of the stuff that's in here that they'll charge for otherwise will be free because he's a registered developer. All right. Now Mac's a little bit weird compared to what we'll talk about later when we talk about uh, the Android stuff. Mac, if you want to be a developer and you want to be able to submit stuff to the Mac store, it's 99 bucks a year. Everybody hear that? All right. And for lack of better words, if you, if, if you have a, let, let's say that Andrew creates an app, all right, he creates his own game and he goes and sends it out there. 
Mac looks for reasons to reject you. Not you, but looks for reasons to reject people. They don't look for, their, their idea is your, your product sucks. You have to convince me it doesn't suck. And if, if you do certain things, and we'll start looking at some of those after the break, but even as far as the basic settings, if they're not set up the way that they want them set up, they'll reject it. What that means is you, they want you to fix it and then submit it again. But they're so closed in the way they do things. Much of that movie that I saw over the weekend was Jobs and Wozniak arguing because Jobs wanted Mac to be everything closed architecture. Wozniak said, no, it's got to be open. It's got to play nice with other things. And, and they got to the point where, where uh, he would say that, and, and every time he would say that, Jobs would look, at it, would look at him and say, F you. And he said, let's try it. So he, he had him keep saying it. He kept saying it back to him. You know, that was a, there was a lot of that kind of stuff in the movie. All right? Now, what is new? In the past, and this is something that's, that's fairly, fairly new. I've read about it, but I haven't tried it. Okay? But in the past, if you were signed up as a developer like that, like we did for free, that means you had access to Xcode, which is the editor and some other stuff. But the only way, place that you could run your, your apps were, were on the actual MacBook because there's a simulator built in. Now their claim, at least, is you can run them on your own device. Okay? But it's very limited. In what you're, you know, not, In other words, you're not going to be able to run it on your own device, give it to other people necessarily, and have them run it on their Mac too. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the claim by Mac is now, so let's say Thwan makes a game. Looks okay on the emulator, but she would like to see what it looks like, let's say, on her iPhone. Their claim is, and I haven't tried this yet because I only read about it over the weekend. Their claim is now you can do that. I don't know what it involves. Yes? Is there a way to hit OS on a Mac OS on a machine? Okay, that's a good question. The question is, is it possible to get... Uh, to get Mac on an Intel machine and put it in as, as a, vir a virtual drive, basically? The answer is yes. I asked about doing that here, and he told me, with all the problems we have with the virtual desktop anyway, that's the last thing in the world I'm going to do. Our, our IT department has told me, we are giving you zero, zero support for anything Mac. Because there is not an IT person here that's trained in any facet of Mac. So if there's ever going to be a problem with this, these machines or somebody drops it, it doesn't work or whatever, we've got to send it off to a Mac store. All right? But yes, and, and yes, and in fact, I have to look, through, look for it, but I've even got a little bit someplace. If you remind me, I've got some documentation on it. Now, technically, technically, that's against the law. All right? That said, Mac knows that there are literally billions of people doing it, and they have not tried. Even companies that are doing it, they have never tried to do anything to, pros to prosecute, ever. I understand. I understand. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Yes. Well, yeah, in essence, yes. All right. So we're going to take a break, but before we do, John's already installed Xcode on these machines. Xcode is the IDE. It's the integrated development environment you use when you're working with Macs. That's the good news. The bad news is it looks totally different than Visual Studio. All right. And not only that, there's all sorts of ways that you can configure it on the top of your screen. So, it, again, it's kind of like look at it this way, okay? You, you know how to, how to live your life. You know how to do everything, all right? But you decide that you're going to take a trip and you're going to go to another country. Now you go to another country and they do things, whatever you do that's so natural here, they do it in totally different ways there. So what, that, what does that mean? Well, typically, while you're there, you have to adapt to their ways, correct? All right. I mean, when I, when I went to Colombia, South America, when we went and, and adopted my middle daughter from Colombia, we had to get buy different types of things for different types of electrical plugs. And they even wanted to check our stuff at the hotel to make sure we bought the right stuff because they didn't want us to fry their system, which makes sense. 
You know, you go to almost any other country in the world, and you know, you 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 put in gas. What are you putting in? You're not putting in gallons, are you? All right. So we have to adapt. This is what we're going to use. Because people have asked me too, is it possible that I could, for example, I, I could could I do this stuff literally? Could I take this stuff that I'm working on? Could I build it? Give it all the names I'm supposed to give it, but could I build it? And could I could I build it on, on an Intel machine? And could I use Notepad plus plus and then up, you know, copy it up, etc. The answer is actually yes. But you've got all these hoops and stuff you've got to run through. And they and of course Mac doesn't guarantee that it'll ever work. But I have taken stuff that I've created here on the Mac. I've taken it home, forgotten my Mac. So gone on the Intel machine, modified files. I made copies, so in case I screwed them up, I had the original. But modified some of my files, because I knew what changes I had to make, uploaded it back to the Mac, and it worked fine. All right. But that's not something, of course, they're going to recommend that you do. All right, so we've gone through Chapter 1. This is the App Store. And just so you know, this thing right here, everybody see where the mouse is? Little hammer, etc. in the upper left corner? That's Xcode. That's going to be on your dock down on the bottom of the screen. So when we get done with the break, all right, we're going to start looking at that. And Mac has a new thing that's out there that's called, or fairly new, it's called Playgrounds. And we're going to look at, at that a little bit after the break. This last thing in here, I have enrolled Blackhawk in the developer program. What you get out of that is if I had, if we had to share information, let's say we were building an app as a class, we could send stuff back and forth to one another, all right? I don't know how much more you get than that. And when we did this, that was like a year ago, so I don't even know if they got another bill, if they paid it or not. So I have no idea. So let's take a break. And so we finished Chapter 1. When we get back from the break, we're going to jump right into Chapter 2, which is Swift Playgrounds. And we're going to take it really slow, so you know. All right? So it says 8.58. Let's come back and let's make it 9.15 so I can, I have time to uh, produce this.